the keynote today. I met Corey House uh, years ago. Um, he had come here to speak um, just as everybody else does. And there was something about Corey and his energy and his vibe that um, I really, really appreciated. It wasn't just that he came and he spoke and he did a thing. It was all the other things that happened around it. It was asking if we needed help. It was, you know, being genuinely involved in a community that surrounded us. And then, and then he just kind of just did that like everywhere. And it was super cool to see. And we've been trying to kind of make it work out with schedules and plans and all that to get him on the big stage and share his story. Um, and that's exactly what we're here to do today. And with that, let's give Corey House a giant round of applause. We are all systems go. All right, let's start with the question. It's early. Who is the very first person that comes to mind for you when you think about success? This person means something. Uh, now, maybe it's a system of our society and what it's conditioned to you, but I also think it may be a statement about your values. So what I'd like to do is go around the room one by one and hear who you think. <laughs> no, that would be silly. Instead, what we're going to do on the count of three, I'd like you to yell out who that person is. I'm serious. One, two, three. <laughs> Justin Bieber? Really? <laughs> okay. Interesting choice. I'm not judging. That's fine. And th this is the thing. <laughs> Wh whoever you choose, it, there's no real clarity on what the right answer and what the wrong answer is. The idea of success is personal. And this is something that took me a long time to realize, uh, despite the fact that it sits right there in the dictionary. It's very clear that success is about accomplishing an aim or a purpose. And all of us in here have different aims or purposes. Even though we're all geeks generally in here, we, there are so many little differences between us and between the things that we want to accomplish in our short time here on Earth. Now, I'm going to make an assumption here, and I think this is a pretty safe assumption. My goal here is to improve your career. And I believe that making you a better geek will make you more successful. And I say that with the caveat of, I'm assuming that your chief aim, one of them, is to be a better geek because you are here at a conference. And we come to a conference because we need to get shaken up because none of us are standing still. All of us are moving very quickly in some direction and for the most part, that direction is automatic. We have inertia just moving us along. We have our relationships and our jobs and our expectations every day to get up and do the same things. And this moves us in a certain direction. So I will be very transparent about what I'm trying to do today. I'm here to change you. I believe that we in this hour can change our trajectory. And you do that by changing the systems that rule your life. Now, when we talk about changing your trajectory, there's something very important that you need to keep in mind is you change your trajectory, you are pointing at something. So the question becomes then, what are you pointing at? And a quote that really changed my life was by Hunter S. Thompson. He said, beware of looking for goals. Look for a way of light. Decide how you want to live. And then see what you can do to make a living within that way of life. This was an eye-opener to me because it really gets down to the heart of it of saying, you know what, I, for instance, I went into a job that I hated. I spent a year managing a dev team because I thought I needed to keep climbing that ladder because why? I love writing code. I love writing code. That was not the way that I wanted to live. I wanted to spend my time writing software, but I wanted to also be proud to tell my mom that I was a manager now. That just seemed like a logical step. For me, it wasn't because it didn't make me happier. It wasn't the way I wanted to live. The way I want to live is working remote. The way I want to live is getting to go to conferences and get other people as excited about software development as I am, even though I've been doing it for 20 years now. So this is how I like to live. I like to learn daily. I like autonomy. I like feeling like I control my own destiny. 
I love variety, and when I say variety, I mean in terms of location where I work, in terms of the people that I work with, in terms of the domains that I work with. So consulting works really well for me, working with lots of different companies. Variety is the spice of life for me. I want to do work that I believe in, and I want to be able to say no to the things that I don't believe in. I had a friend reach out to me. He called me up. He said, so I've got this job offer. It's a $20,000 raise, and I'm really interested in it, but I'm not sure if I should take it. And I said, well, why not? And he said, well, it's, it's with uh, uh, this payday loans company, and I'm not sure how I feel about that. I said, well, no, you're sure how you feel about that. You called me, and you're questioning it. This would be a slam dunk if you believed in it, but you want to be able to say no to the things that you don't believe in because being deeply invested and caring about what you do is super important. We're spending 40-plus hours a week on this thing. Let's do something that hits us in the heart, that really matters to us. I want to help people, preferably at scale. Like, this is awesome for me to get to speak to all of these people. What a privilege. What a privilege. And I want to share more about that story a little later. So here's what I do. Because I now know how I want to live, I work backwards and I say, well, what can I do that gives me that lifestyle? So what I do, I do consulting. I consult with companies all over the place. I happen to specialize in JavaScript and React right now, and that's been working out well. I blog a lot. I author courses for Pluralsight because, again, that gives me a lot of autonomy. And I speak at conferences because, again, the whole scale aspect and because I get to meet a lot of different people. I go sit at a different table at lunch. I literally try to sit down at tables with people that I don't know. The variety is super interesting to me. And of course, yeah, I write code. I write quite a bit of code. It fills in all the gaps. And this means that I work from hotels, and I work outside wherever I find something beautiful that inspires me. It means I work from the swimming pools and even from the beach. So I like that. It doesn't feel like work to me if I'm in lots of different places. I basically like to live like a digital nomad. This is a term that resonates with me. But you may not know what you want. When you talk about designing your life, it's hard to guess exactly what you want. But I'd encourage you, maybe you're at a job right now, and you don't have a remote work setup. I had that. We had no one in our company had remote work. Well, I left for a year. And when I left for a year, I ran into my boss out at Target one day, and he said, hey, how do you like the new job where you're managing a team? I said, I'm miserable. I miss writing code. I don't really like what I'm doing. I want to get back into the tech. And he said, well, would you come back? And I said, absolutely. But one thing I really do enjoy is getting to work remote, because they let us do part-time remote. And to this day, that worked out. He said, yeah, OK, we'll have you back. We'll make an exception for that and let you do that. This is my suggestion. If you want to have a little bit of remote at your team, don't ask if you can work remote 100% of the time. Ask, can we have an experiment? Could I work from home one day a week or two days a week for a set period? And then let's sit down and talk about whether that worked and what didn't work. But that's a much easier ask for your manager than I want to be out of the office all the time. Excellent book on this topic is the book Remote by DHH and Jason Freed. By the way, I'm going to mention tons of books in here. I've got a list of all of them at the end, so you don't have to write all this down. OK, so we're going to talk about seven pillars that I believe help you build an exceptional career in software development. The first, I've numbered pillar five because I'm bad at counting. This is actually what happens when you're really tired and you start dragging slide sections right before you go to bed. <laughs> but we're going to roll with this. I'm not fixing it. Pillar one is psychology. Happiness is an advantage, and make no mistake, we choose whether we want to be optimistic or pessimistic. I spent most of my life being very clearly a pessimist, and when I say a pessimist, uh, I mean pretty consistently when I heard something, I was looking at the negative side of that, and I would complain about it. And that affected the way that I viewed everything, and that also affected the way that people interacted with me. I read a book uh, that really changed the way that I look at the world and the way that I interact with other people called The Happiness Advantage. Anybody read Happiness Advantage? I'm really surprised. I thought it was more popular than that. Maybe only three hands. A very simple takeaway here is that we choose the stories that we tell ourselves. And my wife, she has an aunt who is very, very optimistic. And at first when I met her, I found this really jarring because I would find myself saying something negative and I would immediately hear her point out the silver lining and I go, oh, this is really grating. She's just 
jabbing at me. And then I came to realize, you know, she has this gravitational pull around her because that's exactly what positivity does. People are drawn to the positive. So if we can find a way to make positivity louder, we will find that people are drawn to us. And we can do that in our jobs. Rather than complaining about what's wrong, sell people on the exciting future of what could be. Get up in front of others, have lunch and learns, and get people excited. So my hobby now, when I hear somebody say something negative, I process it for a moment and I can say the silver lining. And I've gotten really good at it. And when I do this in my own life, I find myself feeling more optimistic. Now, this idea of happiness is important because chemicals are involved here. Cortisol is a chemical that is created when we are feeling stress. And this reduces creativity, cooperation, hurts digestion, even leads to diabetes, all sorts of problems with cortisol. But the good news is there's also four very useful chemicals that we can use to hack our psychology. So let's talk about those. These are four chemicals that are listed in the book Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek. Endorphins. Exercise is absolutely key. This is just one of the dozens of reasons that exercise is super important. I got up this morning and I worked out because I wanted to feel as good as I could feel this morning getting up in front of people. Dopamine. This is what you get when you complete a task. I'll be honest, this seems to be my favorite drug. I love checking off tasks. I love checklists where I can go, yep, did that, did that, did that, did that. Serotonin. This is released when you help others. When you help your family, when you help your friends, when you contribute to the community, when you come to a conference and speak for free, that's serotonin making you feel better. Finally, oxytocin. Time with loved ones, hanging out with your family and friends, close ones. All of these together. When I find myself feeling down, not feeling motivated, chances are one of these chemicals needs a little bump. So I ask myself, have I worked out lately? Have I spent enough time with my family? Maybe I've been spending too much time in the code, not enough time with my loved ones. Maybe I've been focused so much on myself, I need to focus more on others. My serotonin is low. When you think about yourself sort of as this jar of chemicals, it's an interesting idea that you can hack your psychology. But the warning is this. Anything up here is potentially addictive. I'll be honest, I seem to be most addicted to dopamine because I have on multiple times been called a workaholic. And again, this whole thing of success is personal, well, a lot of people would look at my life and go, eh, I'm not so sure about that. He seems pretty unbalanced. But I have my own take on what success is to me, and everybody else has to come up with their own balancing act for this life. But here's a little hack. It's so frustrating to me to see people wasting time poorly. Time is so valuable, but the best thing about having some free time is waste it well. Go find something that you really love or that is really productive, but don't waste your time just killing time. So recognize when you're doing that and go, you know what, instead of sitting here, I'm not getting any kind of a chemical happiness hit by sitting here and watching TV for hours. Maybe I should go exercise. Maybe I should go spend time with friends. Maybe I should complete a task. All those things can hack my psychology and create a flywheel effect. Also, you've got to get pretty good at saying no. Over time, we have to do this more and more. And the way to do that is only say yes to the things that really get you excited. I've increasingly had to do this with conferences because if you start paying attention, there are conferences all over the place. And if you start submitting to all of them, what you'll find is you're traveling all the time. You, you can't do that. Um, that's excessive. So now it's got to be something that's just an absolute yes. I want to do this thing. Another thing that I do when I'm wanting to procrastinate, I strive for productive procrastination. I have this habit of, you know what, I don't feel like coding right now, but uh, I'll go exercise for a while. That'll up my uh, feelings. I'll go hang out with the family. I go out a rough house in the hallway for a while. We go drag the kids down the stairs on a blanket. Yes, that's at least as dangerous as it sounds, but they love it. They love it. <laughs> Hopefully no one from child services is here. Yeah. Again, dopamine hit is what you're getting in these cases. All right, I got my numbering right here. Pillar number two is focus. So I've been going to the gym. My wife joined the gym, which was really nice of her because that motivated me to finally join the gym because you've got to keep up. Uh, 
and she goes very, very consistently many days a week. So me, on the other hand, I go for a short period, about five days a week. I found that's something that I can stay committed to. But one thing I've been doing at the gym, when I'm over in the weight section, I go up to the biggest dude there, and I've been consistently asking, okay, so what is your program? And this is my friend Meth, uh, who's a member of the gym. Now, he isn't the biggest guy that I found, but that day he was the biggest guy, and he was nice enough to let me take his picture. And this is one thing that I found very consistent. The huge guys at the gym pretty consistently work out about two hours a day. Two hours a day. That is a serious level of focus. Also, eating multiple meals a day. He said, I eat to the point that I just hate food. He said, I have to have a meal right before I go to bed, and I never want it, but i got to eat this whole chicken breast and this giant potato, and that's what I have to do to keep my arms this big and my chest this big. So this is a massive commitment. And as software developers, we're in this same situation. If you want to be an anomaly, you have to act like one. And that means putting in a lot of time in a little narrow area. So I believe that the biggest problem that we have right now is a lack of focus. So you're at a conference today, and I love conferences, obviously, because I go to them all the time. But a conference is effectively saying, hey, here's 150 things that you should know. When you look through the that conference schedule, that's what you're going to find. And the problem is, if you go dip your toe into all of those things, you're not going to be very effective because you won't know enough about any of them to actually execute, to become exceptional in that thing. Batman, Bruce Wayne, is not real. <laughs> I hope I didn't, yeah, I knew there'd be a few people angered about that. It's, so, there is not actually a guy who is able to run a successful business and be in perfect shape and drive all these awesome cars and fight crime and save the girl. No, it doesn't happen. It is not real. We have to focus because we are not superheroes. So my suggestion to you is to specialize. Be remarkable at something. Find a way that you can be the purple cow in this sea of cows. No offense. Just a metaphor. Jeff Atwood said, being smart is not a reliable path to success, but you know what is? Becoming borderline obsessive about one thing. That's a big deal. And that's something that I have found really powerful because all of us are weird in some way. We need to decide how we want to be weird. It is absolutely okay to be weird. And I, I find pretty much anybody outside of the dev community seems to look at us as weird in some way. It's hard to relate. We have all this strange jargon. But decide how you want to be weird and make it a strategic decision. Now, when you think about specializations, there is a lot of ways to slice and dice this. You can go front end, back end. You can go operation security, maybe performance, maybe be known for a framework or a language or accessibility or a single platform as a service or software as a service. Infinite combinations here. I'll share right now. Think about your career, your current technical skills like a Venn diagram. For me, it's this combination of, yes, I am a React specialist, very deliberately, but I also specialize in particular on web development. I'm not interested in React Native. Native web development is not my focus. I'm not trying to be the expert there. I also focus on the modern JS ecosystem. I know JavaScript better than just about anybody in my house, at least, and better than some people outside. I'm not going to go any farther than that. Yeah. I know JavaScript pretty well, because I've been coding in it since the late 90s, so that is my specialty. Uh, and then I also focus on transitioning teams from React, or I'm sorry, from Angular, Ember, jQuery, Knockout, over to React. That's what's keeping me very busy. So that is a very, very minor niche, but I tell you, I have more work than I know what to do with. Because when people think about that particular thing, oh, my team needs to move to React, who could I help me out with that? Corey hopefully comes to mind. And this is what I would suggest for you. Answer this question. If you can't answer this question, the problem is no one else can either. If you are just a developer, you don't come to mind for people. Be a developer at something. Be exceptional at something. We all have this opportunity, but effectively it means we have to focus. This was the book that turned the light on for me, recognizing that I was doing way too much. And what I needed to start asking myself was, what do I want to go big on? And for me, it was very, very clear. 
I want to go big on front-end development and JavaScript and React. And I want to go big on sharing that at conferences, writing courses, doing consulting. Because that gives me, again, remember that starting off at the beginning, what life do you want to lead? What do you want that to look like? That would give me that life, too. And it was the technology that just resonated with me. Think about Hussein Bolt. He would not be very good as a long distance runner. He is built to be a sprinter. He is purpose built. Everything that he did in his life was structured to make him really good at sprinting. And as developers, we can have the same mindset. Now, as a specialist in React, there's still a massive number of topics that I have to know. And in fact, I don't know everything up here as well as I would like to know it. I can't even keep up in the little narrow niche that I've focused on. Because what you realize is, in almost any area of life, you can almost always drill deeper and drill deeper. Even CSS, it's easy. Just a few thousand key value pairs that have quirks in each browser that you have to memorize. Wonderful. This. Specialization in just CSS makes a lot of sense, too. How many in here are really good at CSS? There we go. Not many hands. It is, I find CSS daunting. This is my technical skills. The, over my 20-year career, I've worked in all of this. And for quite a while, I want to share a little story about this. This was how I wanted people to see me as the guy that had done all this stuff for 20 years. And I even put up a, a page on my blog where I talked about how I was offering training. And I was offering training on clean coding practices and software architecture and automated testing and .NET and all these different things. And let me share with you the results of that story. This was how people were, I was trying to present myself to people. This didn't work out so well. I'll show you the numbers in a second. I had an epiphany and I said, you know what? I want to be known for just this. This is it. I can make a name for myself in this little narrow area if I get really good at it and focus on just that. Do all the reading, spend my time. So I did this. I went out. I built a site. Uh, didn't take long. ReactJSConsulting.com. Focusing on just this one idea. And here's how it worked out in contrast to my old approach. My old approach in 2016, before I'd set up this site, I had three people reach out to me for work. Now, that wasn't the only work that I had, but I only had three that came to me. And it's really nice when people come to you because those are pretty easy to land because if somebody comes to you, they already believe that you're the solution to their problem. Contrast that with 2018 so far. I have had 45 companies reach out to me this year, and we're, what? It's August. It's unbelievable to me how many people have reached out now that I have this area. When you type it into Google, you find it. That goes a long way. And I've completed 15 projects with companies so far. I have many that are in flow right now. Because now they'll find me because I stand out in the crowd. That's the power that you could have to say, what do I want to be exceptional at? What do I want to be known for? A woodpecker can peck 20 times on 1,000 trees and get nowhere and stay busy. Or he can tap 20,000 times on one tree and get dinner. It's a good metaphor for what we're talking about here. Be careful about spending too much time barely trying lots of things and decide what you want to go big on. Ask yourself, what would you want people to Google for to find you? And then start structuring your blog and your image to do so. So when I'm talking about this, obviously education is an important topic. So let's shift over to education, pillar number three. There's a problem going on here in education. In lots of different fields, education uh, is required because knowledge doubles. In medicine, every 87 years, knowledge doubles. Mathematics, every 63 years. Chemistry, every 35 years. Genetics, every 32 years. JavaScript, every 10 months, give or take. Somewhere there. I'm, I'm only kind of kidding, because if you look at the module counts for JavaScript, it is unbelievable. NPM's package manager is head and shoulders above Java's, .NET's, PHP's. It's, just not even close. An engineering degree today has a half-life of 2.5 to 5 years. That means that every 2.5 to 5 years, you have half of your knowledge outdated. It needs replaced. So this leads to a need for 10 to 20 hours of study per week for an engineering degree. So this means that you need to embrace daily learning. A book that I found really useful on this uh, 
was the book Mindset that talks about fixed versus growth approaches. I had a fixed mindset. I often looked at things that I didn't know, and I felt very unsure about trying to learn it because I was concerned that if it was hard, that means it wasn't for me. It means that I'm dumb. I just don't get this. I'm not innately talented at this thing. Compare that to a growth mindset where you say, you know, if this is hard, I need to keep pushing. This isn't about innate growth. It's about the people that get really good at something are the people that just kept going until they got there. Now, when you're choosing a focus, I believe that caring is a huge strategic advantage. And this is what I mean uh, by caring. You start out by finding something that you care about more than other people. And then that creates more dedication. You'll be more dedicated than other people to spend the time on that thing. This will lead to mastery. And once you master that particular item, you're going to build trust. Your boss will trust you. The community will trust you. And as they trust you more, you're going to find yourself with lots of autonomy. And the more autonomy you have, the more ability that you have to say, this is how we're going to do it. This is when I'll work on it. I don't feel like following this schedule. I'll work when I have the uh, attention span and energy and take time off when I don't. All of that leads back to caring more because the better that we get at something, the more passionate we become about it. An excellent book on this topic is... So Good They Can't Ignore You by Cal Newport. And what he points out is competence creates passion. See, back in college, I wasn't really much for software development. In fact, I almost dropped out because I was sitting next to a guy that had been coding for years. He coded in high school. I didn't code in high school. And I was convinced that meant that I was just a bad developer. And it turned out I was just next to somebody that was way ahead of me. And as I got better at software development, I found myself more and more passionate about it because it became part of my uh, image. It became part of who I saw myself as. And that created more passion. Now, the risk here when it comes to education is spending your time on just-in-case learning. And I've spent a lot of time on this. And there's nothing inherently wrong with doing so, but recognize that there's a cost to that. And oftentimes, you're better off spending time on just in case or on uh, just in time learning instead learn it when it is time to do so because you know you get the value out of it and instead try to spend your time learning uh, the fundamentals that you know are always useful when you think about okay I want to learn basic functional paradigms or basic object oriented paradigms or I need to understand relational databases those sorts of fundamentals that you know will stand the test of time now, when you talk about education, it's super important to manicure the stream of information that's coming into your life because we live in a world that is very different than even 150 years ago. See, in the old world, access to data was a form of power. The people in power had that data and then gave it out to certain people. But now we live in a world where anybody can access that data, so effectively, the new power is knowing what to ignore. You have to have real clarity about what pieces of information are actually useful to you or you will find yourself watching, consuming a bunch of things that don't actually move you forward. So th this brings me to a very important principle which is called Sturgeon's Law. Now, <laughs> you could joke about this but it really is uh, an interesting point that you recognize almost any area, yeah, there are some really good vehicles and there are some bad vehicles. Uh, there is some good software and bad software. Um, Sturgeon may even argue that this applies to the keynote. I don't know. But the, the key is to recognize that we need to be very picky about the content that we're bringing in because there's plenty of options out there. Now, if you're curious about my information stream, I documented it out on my AMA, out on GitHub, and uh, there's a, also a link to this at the end in the notes. I'll have a single URL, but this is where I document, here's the videos that I watch, here's the emails that I subscribe to, here are the blogs that I pay attention to, and given, that isn't going to transfer particularly well to you because it's based on my particular focus. Your focus will be different from mine. But you do need to learn how you learn because there are so many different ways out here, and chances are you're learning via a combination of these different approaches. Uh, and I also find that I learn at different stages in different ways. That in a quick introduction via video is super useful for me, but when I want to go deeper, I tend to want to read so that I can go back and jump around, and I want to jump into the code itself. Also recognize that we often pay others to teach us, and there's nothing wrong with that, but 
look at what you're paying for. Be clear that what you're really buying is time. When you're having somebody else teach you, you're likely going to learn it faster. You're also paying for motivation because they are going to push you. And in many cases, you're also paying for a shared experience. Everybody on that team will now know the same things because they worked through it together. That shared experience can be valuable. But I would encourage you, I think the most valuable thing you could do is learn how to teach yourself. And an approach that I find useful, that I use actually to create these talks, is the Feynman technique, which effectively means you write the topic up on a page, then you describe that topic at a level that is basically childlike, that kids could understand. And when you create those kid-level ex explanations, then identify the gaps in your understanding. But it's your ability to restate what's going on there that helps create the knowledge in your head. Because now you're not merely parroting what someone else said, you're saying something valuable in your own way, and that proves that you know it. Also, watch out. Be sure that you're trying to learn one thing at a time. I see this all the time. People try to dive into React and learn it, and I realize that they haven't written any ES6, ES7, ES8 code, that they're only familiar with old ES5 JavaScript. And what you realize is they struggle because they don't know what is React and what is JavaScript. And that makes life really hard because it makes it harder to Google. You find yourself going through React docs and then wondering why they don't explain what they're doing. And they don't explain it because they assume that you know modern JavaScript. So this happens all over the place in technical uh, issues. Uh, so strive to understand what the foundations are you need to know before you go into that particular topic. Another really important thing, this is especially relevant for you here today at a conference. The internet is a massive haystack. And when you read something that you want to reference later, it's super useful to put that in some sort of a form that you can get to later. Effectively, create a smaller haystack that is just yours. Here's three popular ways to do so. I like Evernote. OneNote is also super useful. You can use GitHub as well. I use that for quite a few options when it's more code related, or gists. But effectively, what you're doing is you're saying, here's the World Wide Web. And every time I find something that is super valuable, I want to have a virtual brain that contains this smaller haystack. And then I can go out to Evernote at any point and find this. When I was writing this talk, I was looking for a few quotes that I had read over the years. And I'm able to go into Evernote and search right there and quickly find the quotes that are related to what I'm talking about. So I put quotes in there because I'm, I'm a big quote junkie. Article summaries, books, conference notes, and of course cat gifts. That's, that's key. Anything that resonates for you. All right, pillar number four. Let's talk about image. Developers don't like to talk about image. I, I, I think that we like to believe that the world is a meritocracy, that we will be rewarded by just writing good software. But unfortunately, that's not the case. There are certain things that we have to do to improve our image so people see us in a certain way. Now, I do have some good news, though. Uh, I've come to realize that pros in other fields are held to pretty high standards. They have to have these specialty degrees so that people will take them seriously. Uh, but I have found I don't really believe that the degree matters that much. Uh, I've found this with others that I've spoken to as well. I interview developers all the time. And I have never once said no to somebody because of their education. Uh, there's certainly been people that I looked at and I was really impressed. They had a, a CS degree from MIT. That catches my attention for sure, but that doesn't make them a shoe in We've actually said no to someone that had a CS degree from MIT. I was surprised at that, but it didn't work out. So I don't think that matters. Uh, other areas, look at doctors. Doctors have to wear these nice white lab coats. And as developers, we have our own uniform of sorts. So. We've got our hoodies, and we look at it. And it's interesting to me that uh, this isn't even the, the bar. I mean, if you work at home, then your uniform is probably more a Snuggie, something like that. This, this is honestly me on most days. My, my wife is uh, not happy with what a slob I am, but th that's an advantage of working from home. I do find it interesting, though, that if you think about some of the most well-known developers, I mean, Mark is known for wearing a hoodie. So I think it's pretty cool that we don't judge people by how nice their clothes are. We judge people by the content of what they, they can create, of their abilities, which is pretty cool. In fact, we seem to have this inverse relationship. I'm sure you've seen this one. It's the, it's the developer with the steady job that is wearing the old ratty clothes. It's just, you ever heard the old say, saying, never trust a developer in a suit? That's, that's the risk there. And I have found that too, that there is no correlation. You walk into a, a, a job interview with a tie, that makes you no more likely for me to hire you. And in fact, I've hired plenty of people that came into an interview in an old ratty t-shirt, but I enjoyed the conversation and they knew what they were talking about. 
Now, I do think that you should dress strategically, though. So I think about what are you wanting to optimize for that day. On a lot of days, you want to optimize for comfort. But on some days, you want to optimi optimize for power. Some days when I'm doing consulting, then I will get really dressed up, which for me means putting on a collared shirt. I'm still in jeans. That's about as far as I go with it. But that makes me feel a little more confident. So for what it's worth. Now, this whole idea of self-image, though, I think is really important. So I'm up here speaking right now. And I will say, this is a little bit of a mind bender, but I feel more confident right now because I'm assuming that you look at me in a way that's a little more positive because I came up here and spoke. That gives me more confidence. So effectively, I am who I think you think I am. Something like that. Yeah, take that to the bank. No, uh, uh, effectively, our self-image is affected by how we think other people look at us. So if we can do things that make us assume that people see us in a better light, that's powerful. This is one of the big reasons that I encourage people to do some speaking, because it is a chance to be a leader for an hour. Just try it on. And it can improve your own self-image. That certainly was helpful for me. So on this topic of image, though, there's all sorts of things that you can do to improve your image. And effectively, it comes down to doing everything that you do in public. Tweet as you're learning new things. Go out on LinkedIn. I post there as well. Put your code out on GitHub. Blog. Answer questions on Stack Overflow. Be a guest on podcasts. Write a book. Go create videos online. And then when you go to conferences and you speak, Tweet those pictures out. I often do that as well. Effectively, try to do what you're doing today, but make it more public. Give value back to other people. And as you do that in public, you'll be getting more value. Now, some of you are out there going, oh, OK, this is all about ego, isn't it? No, it is not about ego. What this is about is opportunity. If you want people to use your awesome skills, they have to know about it. And the way that you get people to know about it is by increasing your luck surface area. All of the things that I've listed up here increase your luck surface area, which is effectively, it's about how many people know what you're awesome at. The more people that know that, the more little coincidental things happen. I will say, I speak at conferences a lot, and every time that I speak at a conference, another little piece of business comes in or another opportunity to speak somewhere else because people go, and it's weird. Years can go by. I, I spoke at Iowa Code Camp five years ago, and somebody just reached out to me and said, hey, five years ago, you did a, did a talk. I really liked the slides on that. And also, I was seeing if you could come in. I'm going, what? Five years ago? How did this even come to mind? It's, it's amazing how these little ripples happen over time. OK, pillar number one, <laughs> communication. <laughs> Maybe pillar one should be practice. I don't know. I, yeah. So there's a stereotype that developers are poor communicators. And that is absolutely a stereotype. There are so many different types of developers. I think this is silly. But I will say, communication is key in whatever industry you're in. So let's talk about it for a second. One thing to look for, if you are an expert, you should be the person asking all the right questions. Why, where, when? Jeff Atwood has a great post on this, and this image is from it. So if you go look through his uh, Google for Jeff Atwood expert, it's an excellent post on this. But I love this point because the thing to watch out for is becoming dogmatic because you've been working for a while and you have your own preferences. Effectively, the longer that you've been coding, the more that your answer should be, it depends. And I find this all the time. People ask me a question, which is better, this or this? And I find myself asking five or six questions and then going, OK, let's talk about the context and let's talk th about the merits of this versus this. I'm not going to say, go do this all the time because chances are, there's no silver bullet. And when you're doing this, it's super important to get good at sales, to be able to sell ideas. Because as Daniel Pink says, we are all in the moving business. What we're doing is moving people. We're trying to move them through ideas. And as software developers, we're doing that all day. I'm trying to sell somebody on us using this pattern or this technology or sell my boss that we should do automated testing before we get this out the door so that we're not working nights and weekends. Now, you're going to find yourself in discussions where people are pretty heated. You may even get into a discussion about TypeScript versus JavaScript. That could get very ugly. Fools argue, wise people discuss. And when we talk about discuss, this is really about a desire to get to the heart of the matter. And there are all sorts of taboo topics that we ignore because we're scared about getting in an argument. 
We don't talk politics. We don't talk religion. We don't talk money. We sometimes talk tabs versus spaces, though. It, but again, that, that can get ugly. That, that is as taboo. But what if you change your mindset? What if you stop saying, I'm interested in whether I'm right or you're right, and instead we join together and we say, we are both interested in what is right? Uh, this is a lot like Stephen Covey's idea of seek first to understand. That's really powerful. And I will say this, I have conversations at conferences on religion and on politics and on divisive topics and technology, like strong types versus weak types, because I want to understand why other people have different views on these things. That helps me understand my views, and my views have changed on all of those things over time based on all those conversations. We have to be open to the idea that we might be able to learn from others. And I would encourage you on this front to keep your identity small. Don't label yourself as a React developer. Label yourself as, well, right now I happen to specialize in React. But you know what? As soon as something better comes along, I'll drop it and move on. That is not who I am. It's just what I happen to focus on right now because I'm enjoying it. And that's true in all sorts of facets of life, that if, if your identity is small, then you won't feel offended when somebody points out that maybe your current preferences or ideas aren't ideal, or points out a hole in your reasoning. Richard Feynman said, I'd rather have questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned. So on this front, I believe that you should talk money. Uh, I don't suggest doing it with coworkers because there are some particular problems that can come out of that unless you work for a company that has decided that's cool. But I do recommend having those conversations with people outside of your company so that you get a sense of what you're doing. I will say this, back in 2000, I was working at Cracker Barrel as a waiter, going to college. I was making 250 an hour waiting tables. And I was writing some plain HTML websites for the university that I was going to. The local chamber of commerce came to me and they said, hey, we heard you're a web developer. Could you build a website for the local chamber of commerce? I went, oh, yeah, sure. And I sat down and we went through the requirements. And then at the end they said, so do you, uh, how much would you charge for this? And I kind of froze for a second and I just blurted out, $850. <laughs> so... I, I took a picture of this check stub down here, and after taxes, I put in two months of hard work, nights and weekends, uh, so I'm sure you're looking at that number and going, WTF, 653, by WTF, I, I mean the traditional way too few dollars, so yeah. I tried that joke outside and it fell flat, but I wanted to give it one more shot, so. So my encouragement is, I quoted that number because I had absolutely no idea what my value was. No idea. And I had no one else to talk to, so I would encourage you. I had another friend. I, I was charging 50 bucks an hour years ago for uh, software development, and I had a friend come in, and he just point blank asked me, he goes, so how much are you charging? I'll tell you, I'm charging 125 right now. And I go, what? 125? That's possible? That's a thing? People can do that? And he said, yeah, you should. Next client, ask him that. Sure enough, next client, they said okay, and I was amazed, but I had never had my eyes open because no one had talked money with me before. So ever since then, there are a group of speakers that I know that we talk finances very, very candidly because we're independent and we quote with other people. That's a really powerful thing, uh, to have the information, have the knowledge of what you could be worth. When you are here, I want to challenge you at lunch today to avoid your coworkers. I don't mean, there's nothing wrong with them, I'm sure, but I believe that you should sit with people that you don't know. You have an opportunity today to effectively get free consulting from your fellow attendees. When I come to these conferences, I try to sit down at a table with people that I don't know. This is what I do. I say, may I join you? Almost always people say yes. Sometimes they say seats taken. You, you don't get that too often, though. Then I say, where are you from? What tech do you work in? Any good sessions? Where are you going next? I will tell you, Years ago, when I first went to a conference, that was one of the most terrifying things in my life, was to go sit down at a table of people that I didn't know. I felt very uncomfortable about that. And now I've gotten to the point that I really enjoy it. And you come to realize, what's the worst that could happen? Sit down and get to meet some new people. It's fun. My networking rule, though, is to just be real. 
network with people that you like. I think networking has a negative connotation, but I enjoy getting to know new people, and I recognize, you know, I'm not going to connect with everybody, but I'm just really out here making friends. Uh, there's no ulterior motive there, it's, but some of my best friends really are fellow speakers and attendees from conferences. I have gone out to dinner and hung out and made so many relationships uh, in the community and taken some awful pictures along the way, but it has been fun. If you want to get better at this aspect, I recommend the book Win Friends and Influence People. What you come to realize is it largely comes down to truly listening to others and complimenting people in a genuine way, and I really do mean genuine. If you, if you can't say anything nice, then don't say anything at all. That's what my mom always taught me. Uh, that is true. Uh, but I found this book really useful, despite its odd title. Now, on this front, you want to get better at communication, I encourage you to speak. Speaking will force you to get better. And there are so many benefits that come from it. This is about thinking about second-level thinking. See, going to a conference and speaking for free, you might wonder, well, what the heck? Why would I do that? Is there any benefit from that? Well, yeah, in the second level there is, because... Not that initial speaking didn't pay me money, but it did increase my luck surface area. It did put a whip at my back and force me to get better. It did uh, also give me this opportunity to get to meet all these new people. So in the second order, it was really useful. This is true all over in life. If you can look at not the initial impact, but the long-term impact, that will change the way that you look at a lot of opportunities in life. So I tweeted this out a while ago that... I speak at conferences because I benefit immensely. It forces me to learn. It improves my confidence. I make new friends. I get into the conference for, tr for free. I travel for free. My family is here. We got to uh, travel out here and hang out and make a, a week of this super cool. I get free consulting from all of you. I sit down at a table and we talk tech, and I get inspired from everyone. So well worth it. Now, if you are interested in going into speaking, I encourage you, start out with a lunch and learn. That's the way I did at my local office, did a lunch and learn, and then I did a local meetup and got comfortable there. Once I'd done that, I moved on to a code camp and then to some regional conferences, and now I get to speak uh, internationally at conferences. And yes, you get free flights to London and to Oslo and to Copenhagen and all sorts of cool places if you speak for an hour or two. If you like traveling, that's a pretty good gig, and that is attainable. Just move through this. It's a lot like starting a band. You start local, and then you get concentric circles around your hometown. Now, I do find it odd, though. Jerry Seinfeld talks about this, that the two greatest fears in life are death and public speaking, and public speaking is number one. It's crazy. It's crazy, and he, he even points this out. That, so that means that the person that is giving the eulogy would rather be in the ground, Crazy. You can make that something that's a matter of your past. And I will say, I have made a lot of mistakes speaking up at conferences. There's been words that I wish I could get back and talks I wish I could have done better, but I have not ever looked back and said, you know what, I'm disappointed that I made my art. All right, let's talk about pillar number six, which is time. We all have the same 24 hours in a day is a common saying, and I don't buy it. I, I used to think that that was true, but now I realize that money buys time. Let's look at examples. Pay someone to mow your yard. Pay somebody to clean your house. Pay the fix-it man to do your remodeling, or fix existing problems in your house. I was out in Colorado with the family last week. We were uh, traveling. You could pay extra money to go into the express lane and get through traffic faster. Uber is effectively selling us time. It's quicker than me dealing with the taxis and dealing with parking. Valet parking, they are selling you time. How about flights? Of course, when I fly, I am buying time. I'm paying extra money to get there faster. When I paid for TSA Pre, I was paying $75 so that I could get some time back. When you fly on... A nice airline, you can pay extra money so that you can get a good night's sleep. Yes, that is literally a private cabin on a Theod Airlines. I can't believe that's a thing, but I'm pretty sure it's a lot more than coach. I, I haven't looked it up, but yeah. You can also use money to buy yourself mental bandwidth. All of my bills are auto-paid, so I don't think about it at all. I glance at them and make sure it looks right. I go through Quicken once a quarter or so and make sure things look good. But that is a portion of my life. My finances are not on my mind. They don't affect my, my technical mental capacity in any way. 
So all sorts of ways that you can buy mental bandwidth, eliminating your debt, living beneath your means, moving to a quiet neighborhood. And this whole live beneath your means is super important. The, the thing that is, saddens me is how many developers that I've seen that get a raise and then immediately go out and buy a car that they need to pay off over five or six years. And you go, man, you could keep the old car. You could start buying time instead. And once you buy that time, what you find is you'll probably have a quality of life that far exceeds whatever you got from that BMW. So I am happily driving my 12-year-old car uh, because I want to buy time instead. I embrace futuropia, which is this idea of being immensely, intensely future-oriented, regularly thinking about the future. And when you do that, you make better decisions because you start to realize the long-term implications. In fact, there was a very interesting study from Harvard that talked about this, that the real problem that people face at the lowest socioeconomic level is all they can think about is the next few hours because they're worried about where do I get my next meal? How am I going to make that car payment? How am I going to get to my job tomorrow? What am I going to do to make sure that my kids get a good education? It is really difficult to move forward in life when you are fixated on the next meal. And that is becomes systemic. People at the highest socioeconomic level are thinking not just hours down the road, but often years down the road of where's the market going? Where's the technical market going? What is this new skill that I could get? The more that you choose to buy time, the more advantage that you have in the United States because we really have to think longer term. So when we talk about this, all of us have the same 24 hours-ish, but we have the ability to buy more time. Well, this is the way that we divide our life. And I will say, I have divided my life uh, in a certain way that has worked out pretty well for me. But honestly, when you look at all of these aspects, I spend nearly all my time on family and job. Is that success? I don't know. For me, I'm, I'm happy and it, it matches my current values, but that means that I'm ignoring a lot of these other things up here, which for you, you would define as failure because you have a different model of how you want to balance all of these things. But again, if you want to be an anomaly, you have to act like one. So if you want to be perfectly balanced in all of these things, you'll probably have a hard time being an anomaly, being a standout. But there is one thing you can do. You can multi-thread your life, which is accomplishing multiple things at the same time. I love doing this. So when I'm in the car, I'm learning. I've got a podcast on or an audiobook on. When I'm exercising at home, if I get on the elliptical, I'll plop the laptop up and watch a Pluralsight course or an Egghead video or YouTube video, something to learn along the way. Or my favorite is roughhousing with the kids because I'm not just getting time with my loved ones. Yes, you guys are on the screen. It's very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is also a form of exercise. As I'm dragging them around on the blanket and uh, wrestling, that is good exercise. So you're, you're sort of getting multiple things out of it. Okay, let's talk about pillar number seven, and then we will uh, wrap up in here. I want to talk about systems. This is the overarching idea, because I just shared a whole lot of things that you could potentially change about your life, and I believe that the way to do that is through systems. An excellent book that drives this point home is How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big. And the point that it makes is that systems are preferable to goals, that we should think in terms of systems instead. Let me, let me show you some reasons why. Goals have an end point, but systems don't. Goals require us to have ongoing willpower. Systems don't. Goals are all or nothing. You either hit the goal or you didn't. Systems aren't that way. And finally, goals even limit our upside, whereas systems don't. You can have unlimited upside. So on this front, look through everything that I have shown you in the last hour or so. Notice that I've shared a whole bunch of systems. All of these are systems that I use in my life. I am regularly public. I've just everybody. Test, test. Uh, so I assume you got to make this one hot then? Is it seriously? Oh, God. <laughs> well, at least I didn't do that on stage. That would have been embarrassing. <laughs> Systems. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, that was great. Okay, so that was not the dramatic ending that I had planned. 
Oh, okay. I seriously just hit the power button on it too. Okay. If you want success, three steps. Define what it is to you. Figure out the price that you've got to pay. And then go pay it. That's, that's really simple. Now that first one, define what it is to you, is probably the hardest part of all. And I think the thing that not enough people are doing. So, so my focus, one of my primary focuses, chief aims, is to grow developers. So as I'm trying to do that, here's the system that I've been using. I learn daily, I build stuff, and I share it. Not complicated. If you want to do something like what I'm doing, this is a system that could work for you. Again, very, very simple, but you just, it becomes habitual. And what I do is, in my free time, I'm reading posts on Medium. I have all of this stuff fed in through my information stream, so I don't have to go out and get it. It comes into my inbox. It's all automated. Now, I want to, at this time, invite my family up on stage. They didn't know I was doing this, but come on up, guys, everybody. Oh, they're very excited, though, except my wife, who looks terrified. I don't know. Come on up. Come on up. There we go. Ooh, applause. There we go. Nice. Come on up, bud. Okay. Here, let, come, come over here in the, in the light so everybody can see your pretty faces here. Okay, so this is a family affair. The fact that I get to go to conferences and speak all the time requires a lot of help. And it requires me to say goodbye to people that I really love for a few days. And that is super hard to do. So last six years... 33 conference talks written, 50 conferences, 135 conference sessions that I have presented, over 50 consulting sessions, 50 blog podcasts. I have recorded over 30 hours of content for Pluralsight. So you can imagine that work-life balance for me has been hard. And, and I will say that if my wife and I are talking about something that is stressful, it's usually that she's saying, you should just take some time off. <laughs> it's because... I really, again, remember how I said you can get addicted to certain happiness chemicals? For me, it's often dopamine. Like, I like checking things off. So I have them up here because there's no way that I could do all of this without my wife's help and her commitment to um, helping make all this happen. Uh, and uh, I have been gone a lot. I, over the last five and a half years, I use TripIt to track all my travel. 101 trips that I've been on totaling... 190,000 miles, 82 cities, 8 countries. It's crazy. So I started speaking five and a half years ago. Uh, it hasn't been that long. Uh, but when I see it this way, I go, wow. And, and I'm totally guessing that a lot of you look up here now and you go, wow, okay, that, that's not success to me. And I, I totally get it. Frankly, if I look at that, I'd go, yeah, that, I don't know that that looks like success either. But um, I will say we just celebrated our 12th year anniversary. So <laughs> that's pretty cool. Okay. So, oh, I'm sorry. You got, I got hooked on you. Uh, my daughter was going to do a dance now. Is that the plan, Macy? No? You changed your mind? Okay. All right, everybody, can you give them a big hand? I love you all. All right, you can sit down, buddy. I want to be very clear about the cost of these things because it is significant, very significant. When I wrote my Pluralsight course on React and Redux, I had no TV, no sports, no news, no games. I rarely saw my friends and family for about six months. It was meals, basically, was what I was going through because I was holding down a full-time job and doing this. That was six months of pain. Now, given all of this came out to some really good things for me. Uh, I get to consult all over the world. I get to keynote conferences multiple times a year. Over 350,000 people have watched my Pluralsight courses, which is awesome. But I want to be clear about the cost because this is what happens to people. We tend to envy other people, but we don't know the cost that they paid. And in fact, once you see the cost that a lot of these people have paid, you go, I don't envy you anymore. I don't want your life because your life is not my life. It doesn't share the values that I have. So I'm up here being very transparent because I don't want to give you a picture that trying to be a standout is easy or all win. It is, it is a heck of a cost. But Steve Martin's book, if you're going to get one audio book that I mentioned, get this one. It is narrated by Steve. Phenomenal. Listen to it on the way to work. What you realize is Steve stood in comedy shows all by himself. 
all by himself, telling jokes in hopes that somebody walking by might walk in and sell a drink. Like, that is dedication to the cause. And very, very few people are willing to go through that kind of pain to get to where he got. And that's why he got there. He was awful for a long time and slowly got better. Let's wrap up. So I just shared seven pillars for building an exceptional career. And again, the way that you decide to mix these, the things you decide to take away, it's up to you because success is personal. Now, I know that I just shared a lot of things that you can change in your life, but I know that you won't act on a vague desire to get better in some way. Everybody in here has something they could potentially change. And I believe that you need to change your system to create that. So here's my challenge to you right now. You probably all have smartphones. Get them out. Get them out. Open your calendar app. You're going to be back in the office on Thursday, back in your regular life. Was there something, one thing that I shared that has you thinking, you know what, I want to make a change? I'm not asking you to change a bunch of things, but one thing. And this is just a short list of the potentials of what I went over. But if you want to change your life, you've got to change your systems. So that's my challenge to you, is to plug that in right now. If you go to that URL at the bottom of the screen, that shares all the information that I have. I have a list of about 30 books that I found really inspiring that uh, helped me write this talk, that have made me a better developer. The thing that you'll find is none of those are on software thing you'll also find is all of them relate to software in ways that you'll soon see. This afternoon, 1 o'clock, I'm doing an open spaces on going independent, freelancing, moonlighting. I'd love to see you there. We are going to break taboo. If you come over there and you want to talk money, I'll talk money with you. Uh, we can also talk politics and religion, but that seems unrelated. But nonetheless, I will <laughs> break taboo. My goal is to really have an open conversation about what life is like in that space and to learn from others that are doing that same thing. If you liked this talk, I have a course out on Pluralsight that uh, contains, there's hardly any content that I've covered today that's in there, but it is of a similar vein about becoming an exceptional developer, what I called becoming an outlier there. Um, if you are not a Pluralsight subscriber, I have a little stack of free trials up here. Come up and say hi, you're welcome to it. They also have free trials online, but these are for a longer period. So I want to close just briefly with a, a short story. Six years ago, I had never spoken at a conference. Back up a little bit farther. Ten years ago, my son was born, the oldest uh, son that you saw up here, Max. About that same time, I took a job doing a technology that I had very little experience in, PHP. And I was the only developer working for a husband and wife who were having marital problems and screaming at each other a lot and very stressed out about whether the business was going to succeed. And I found their stress affecting me. And I found that I was very isolated, that I was coding all by myself, eight hours a day. I had very little interactions on a day-to-day -day basis, and I slowly found myself with a bad case of social anxiety uh, that was stemming from the stress of being a new dad and the stress of working in something that I didn't understand that well and the stress of trying to deliver. And I remember sitting on a chair reading this book on shyness. And I was reading that book because I thought, yeah, I must be shy, and this is a problem I need to solve. And I remember my wife came up and I hit it and she's going, what are you reading? And I, 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 she kind of sheepishly showed her. She's going, but you're not shy. And I thought, well, I, I don't know what I am, but I'm struggling. Like I could be sitting on a couch and I could break into a sweat and my face would go flush just at the thought of going out and socializing. The most terrifying thing that I could think of was going to some kind of a mixer where I'd have to stand around and just have small talk with fellow people. That that sounded terrifying. So I ended up going to the doctor, taking anti-anxiety meds. And as I was taking those, my father had a heart attack. So we're in the hospital. And my sister's crying, and my mom is crying. And it is an objectively emotional situation, because it looks like he's 
probably going to die. He's right on the edge. And I have no emotion about this at all, which is the most bizarre thing. But that was one of the side effects of the drug, that it tends to turn you more into a robot. I could be in very stressful situations, and I could feel these electrical signals pulse all over the top of my head. And when I felt those, I didn't feel stressed. It was like this superpower. It could just, the stress could wash over me and go away. But I knew that I couldn't stay that way because it, it wasn't me anymore. It took away my emotion. So I had a decision on how to handle that. And the way that I decided to handle it was, what is the craziest thing that I could do to start to get over this? Because I battled with that for a few years afterwards and finally decided, you know what? I think the craziest thing I could do is start speaking. I could get up in front of a crowd, and if I can do that, then surely I can get over the day-to-day -day social anxieties that were driving me nuts. And I did. That was five and a half years ago, and today I get to do a keynote for a 1,000 people, and I will tell you, I'm not kidding, that I am as comfortable up here on stage right now as I would be sharing a coffee one-on-one -on -one with you. And that is a super bizarre thing for me to say, um, to get to that point. But that comes from slowly, over time, fighting my fear and stepping out and going, I think I can do this. And eventually, you convince yourself that you can. So my challenge to you, if you look around, but you realize that what's behind fear? Nothing. Thank you. <laughs>